Hi there, my name is Gronia Humphreys. I'm the director of the Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival. This year represents the 20th anniversary of the festival. We took this opportunity to invite some of our closest friends and finest film creatives to join in a wide ranging conversation about the last 20 years of the festival, of our cinema, and their plans and hopes for the future. We're delighted that the conversation is hosted by Chief Film Critic of Screen, Finn Halligan. Enjoy. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this panel to celebrate the Dublin International Film Festival's 20th anniversary. And we're look in it, we're hoping to look at the now, a little bit about the past, uh, about the now and about the future. And with me here, I have some people who know all about that, working in the Irish film industry at home and being in Irish films abroad and being in international films and making a name for themselves wherever they go. If I just introduce everyone one by one, I'll start with uh, John Butler, who probably needs no introduction to anybody, but I'll give it a go anyway. The director of The Stag, Handsome Devil, Poppy Chulo, just working on The Outlaws and uh, has been to the forefront really of, of really John, you've, you've brought your films with you overseas and traveled with them and introduced them to audiences and made you know, made films both inside Ireland and outside Ireland. So you, you, I hope that later on in the conversation, you'll be able to talk about, about that a bit. Um, next up, we have Donal O'Hiroy, who you'll probably know very well from Arat, if you've seen it, that magnificent film. And Donal, you've, you've also, you've been overseas and you've come back and you've been in the UK. So we'll talk about that. Uh, Fionn O'Shea from, from Handsome Devil. So I don't need to introduce these two to each other, John and, and Fionn. And, uh, and, and many other parts as well that we'll hopefully talk about. You've been working in the UK too, Fionn. Niamh Alger, The Virtues, Censor with Prano Bailey Bond and many more besides. Hi Niamh. Hello. Uh, we have then um, Claire Dunn, who with the magnificent film herself, which she wrote herself and starred in herself and uh, has brought her around the world. And you were just actually named a European shooting star this past week in Berlin. So Claire, thank you for coming on. No worries. And then finally, we have the, the newest and the freshest, which is Daryl McCormick, who you probably won't know yet, but you will know by the end of this year because he's um, just starred in the amazing Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, um, directed by Sophie Hyde and co-starring Emma Thompson. It's very much a two-hander, a chamber piece um, set in a hotel room and a small bit in a bar. Um, so we, we can talk a little about that, I hope, Daryl, and, and your experiences to date. So I guess because we're here for the Dublin Film Festival, I did want to start off by asking anyone to chip in if they have any memories or what the Dublin Film Festival might have meant to them. Now, I'm thinking, John Butler, as you are on the board of the Dublin Film Festival and you, you know, you've been here many times that you might have something to chip in on that first. Well, I guess I'm, a, I'm a, uh, from Dublin, so I suppose my relationship with the festival comes as a Dubliner, um, first and foremost. Um, and, it, you know, there's always that kind of um, special thing that you have with your hometown in relation to your work, uh, whether or not it's the film festival. But um, And I guess this just applies as an Irish person as well. No matter what your film does anywhere else in the in the world, like if you're fortunate enough to take it to other countries or to other festivals, it's great to see it with, you know, audiences from other countries. But there's something, I don't know how everyone else feels about this, but there's something way more intimidating about putting it up on a screen in your home country or in your hometown because you can talk any kind of line of nonsense that you like when you're away and get away with it and feel brilliant about yourself. But like when you're in Dublin or in Diff, it's kind of, your mom's in row four, <laughs> your schoolmates in row 20. And, you know, it's quite a kind of exposing experience. But at the same time, that gives it um, the capacity to be the best experience because it's so intimate in that regard. And so, um, I don't know, like, it just feels like a real um, full circle moment, um, particularly if you grew up going to the cinema or having those formative cinema experiences in the same cinemas where your film is now playing, you know, I certainly remember with Handsome Devil it playing in Savoy 1 and, you know, being there on the night and thinking, God, I remember seeing Terminator 2 here and I remember seeing, you know, Pulp Fiction here and, you know, or even further back than that, like I remember seeing E.T. there. Um, I'm old. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a really, uh, it's a really important one for uh, home, hometown 
hometown people to be able to play their film in their hometown and put it up in front of their their friends and neighbours, I think. What about you, Claire? Because I think that you, you know, you, you, your, your film became a kind of a COVID, you, you were sort of, you know, stuck in the middle of that. How, how did that work out for you? Um, it was, well, it was, I have a very fond memory of it, actually, because it was the last hurrah before we all locked down. It was like the 8th or 9th of March, I think, in 2020. Um, and it was a, it was just like John says, I was absolutely breaking it because um, it was a story set in Dublin very much um, with its all its, I don't know, intricacies and problems and flaws and great cultural landscape all shoved in there with a bit of social consciousness and I don't know, everything. It was like years in research. So I felt like I had to, um, I, I was scared basically about like, did I honour everyone that I met along the way researching it and stuff like that? But um, it was also just a night where there was, yeah, lots of family and friends there. And it felt like a very nice culmination of the journey. You know, it was like the story came from Dublin. I, I moved back to Dublin just to kind of work on it for years and um, and then it finally reached that point and I know then the pandemic happened but um, it was lovely to have that one communal moment with someone there it was really really nice um, but also for me my association with DIFF is kind of during the journey as well because when I was back when I was writing it and I had no one really or I, I'd just begun to get some support from the Irish Film Board and um, I weirdly got a tip off for renting an office in Diff's offices on the Keys. So Grania was above me <laughs> running Diff and I was downstairs pasting all my post-its and my plans and my character biographies all over this wall um, in an office. And uh, she definitely didn't know who I was back then. <laughs> I was nobody. She's like, who's this woman that comes in and basically has a mental breakdown on the walls in the office? Um, but, <laughs> genuinely though it was really cheap office rental um, and it was really <laughs> great support and it was a brilliant base for me and I felt like this weird um, connection to the festival uh, as I went along the journey as well which was really nice. How about you Neve? How, how, how's, how's your relationship with Div? Div it's funny like um, for me Div is like the very first festival that I ever went to not when I was an actor but I used to work in the cinema in um in Cineworld in Dublin and I remember like the uh the, my manager gave me tickets for a diff because he was they were showing you know some of the some of the movies from the festival there. so that was so it was that diff is actually the first ever film festival that I went to and there was a first festival that um a film I did premiered at and then that was kind of like how I got my agent so yeah it's it's um it's a very special festival for me um and it was also the last physical festival that I was at because Camus Horses was there back in 2020 so <laughs> I feel like I need to get back there I think and go to it and I think things will like start kicking off again but yeah it was um and it's like what John said you can't hide you can't like just um I don't know there's like there's no anonymity when you go when you go to dip because it's all your mates or your family um that are in the audience and um and that's it's 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 a it's a blessing, but it's also terrifying. Yeah. Fiona, I mean, you you were there obviously with Handsome Devil as well. And and, and I mean, can you sort of a little bit about your experience, but also to like, I mean, how important is it to you guys as young actors to be able to see and take part in the kind of things that Diff will show you, you know, the the, the Q&As, the, the close up experience with the filmmakers. I mean, I'm, I'm presuming that you you went, you, you attended before Handsome Devil, but maybe you didn't. Uh, no, I, I I did. And I, I loved going. I I, um, I mean, it's funny, John, talking about the Savoy, I think mum bought 400 out of the 800 tickets that were available when um, <laughs> they went on sale. But um, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I always loved going and I used to go all the time with, um, with my dad and and it was kind of, I don't know, probably my first introduction to um, a, a lot of European cinema as well that maybe I hadn't, I don't know, maybe I just, I, I, I was probably ignorant to a lot of it to be honest, but that was an opportunity to go with, with my dad and see all these films that um, maybe otherwise I wouldn't see or, or didn't necessarily have a full theatrical release uh, coming to Ireland. So, um, yeah, it definitely it definitely was a huge learning experience for me, but also somewhere where uh, it's a really beautiful community um, feeling 
there you know that that's where i've met so many um friends too and and you meet so many actors i think actually me that might have been where we met i'm not sure um i think so i don't know anyway i've, I've met so many uh, actors and 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 filmmakers and there's just a really lovely atmosphere that i think is um kind of uh yeah really rare it feels very homely I mean, Donald, your film, the Eruct, which you had in, 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 in Dublin, it hadn't premiered in Ireland. And I think it was the Irish premiere. Am I correct? Was that a particular kind of feeling when you when you brought that to the to the screen there? I mean, you know, especially as it's so intricate with Irish history. And Yeah, very much so, Finn. And I guess just to kind of echo what everyone has said, like Dublin <clears throat> Film Festival for me was always one it always felt like an authority of Irish film, you know. Um, I grew up in Galway, so I'd have a much more, be much more familiar, I'd, I suppose, with the Galway Film Festival. But I remember moving to Dublin kind of in my early 20s and seeing Irish films play at Dublin and being like, wow, God, if, imagine if you had a film playing at Dublin, like it's a, it's a big deal, you know. Um, so we premiered Aruch there. Uh, it has had its Irish premiere there and it was a full house and, I was, uh, I think all of us involved with the film were uh, very nervous, um, but it was a remarkable evening and uh, we got a great welcome and, and Grania and the team there really kind of made us feel at home and uh, did did a lot for, for our film and uh, not dissimilar to herself or Kamath Horses, COVID kicked in then and kind of put a put a break on things for a while, but it it, it um, managed to you know pick up best Irish film there, and it was kind of the start of its journey really. Um, so, so yeah, hugely positive relationship with Diff, and uh, it's great to see you know see it flourish in the way it continues to to do so. Well, I'm going to turn to Daryl now because there hasn't been time to get Daryl's. Daryl's film is so fresh. <laughs> that it's, it's even too early to even be to be in diff and it, it was um it did a massive deal at sundance where it premiered and um uh, it was was bought worldwide uh and, and will be coming to a cinema near you but that would preclude it you know going to a festival this early daryl did, did you have any experience with, with diff yourself or are you still waiting for that for that moment i'm still waiting yeah i i mean the only experience is just i mean I left Dublin maybe four and a half years ago. So I think I was too broke to go to like, to like I don't know, I was working so many jobs or something and I just like never got to go. But um, just to kind of reiterate what everyone's saying, very much aware like of how special the community is in Dublin and how small it is. So I was always looking to what was on and, you know, I was always hanging around the lighthouse anyway, regardless. Um, but no, unfortunately, as of now, I haven't, I haven't been involved uh, with the film yet. So but hopefully some, someday soon. I think for me, it's easy to look at all of you now, you know, in boxes on my screen and think of how successful I know I know you all to be. But as, as we're going around talking, I, I you can piece together the fact that a lot of you have moved around and it's and it's been quite a struggle um, to get to where you <laughs> to this box now and to the things that the, the amazing things that you've done. And, and certainly I think in, in with regard to earlier generations working in Irish cinema, you guys are a lot more fluid in, in, in where you've gone and what you've done and the, the, the things that you've tackled. Um, jo John, given that you, you were probably, you know, out, out of the group here, the first to try taking your work overseas, although, you know, the stag was shot low budget in, in Dublin. Can you talk a bit about how the, the sort of challenges that you've, you've, you've had to, you know kind of you know to go through to, and what kind of help you've had like what 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 helped you the most um well I, i'm a, bit, a kind of diff, a weird case in the sense that i because I, I grew up in the 90s so i emigrated uh, with a green card to america in the mid 90s because there wasn't like the economy hadn't started to seem like it had any potential to employ irish people in their own country and um, so I, I went and lived in California in, in San Francisco for many years and then came home because I wanted to try and make films. And, and I knew there was a film board, but I didn't. So, I, you know, I thought the only way to do to get my mitts on that money would be to get back to Dublin. And, and so the help that I got was from being funded to make shorts, uh, like a little short I wrote and another one I directed. And, and so and I always remember feeling so fortunate that as an Irish person that there was a, a nationally kind of funded agency for that because you get to make a thing like people give you money and you get to make a thing and then put it up put it in a cinema and that's like you know I don't know how everyone else feels but it's so it's so amazingly validating to see that thing on screen like because you just and also back then 
you couldn't shoot a film on your phone. You know, it was a it, it was a big barrier to entry because you had to have you had to hire a camera guy to, to who knew how to operate the cameras that were big. And you know, I think the first thing I shot was on film as well. So you know, it wasn't like you could just go get it yourself. Um, which is maybe a difference with today. But I think the benefit of, of my experience was in coming home. Um, because it's weird, you kind of think of California as the land of the movies and all that, but like I had to come back to Dublin to get anything going. Um, so I always had that association creatively with coming with coming home and with with uh, with doing work. Um, but I'm just looking at all the other boxes and because everyone else is is an actor, you know, I'm interested to hear those stories because so much of that life is about being away and being rootless and being on the move. You know, so they're the yeah, more interesting people in that regard you know well I, I mean what you said about going to LA Donald didn't you end up did you went to 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 America did you or correct me if I'm wrong but I have a feeling that you did I did yeah I did yeah I did I couldn't get arrested over there you know what I mean um <laughs> I found it uh I found it a, a challenging place I was grafting away there and not dissimilar to John's journey uh it was really kind of when I came back to Ireland that uh you know work started picking up um so um, that was my experience with it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for the time I spent there. I'm actually heading back there now in a few weeks again, but um, definitely there's, you know, stuff happening at home. I found there's stories being told here um, that are of a kind of, a, you know, a sincere quality. And uh, I think we're, we're really creating strong work here. And there's a high standard of storytelling uh, in Ireland, the UK at the moment, you know. Are you definitely going to get arrested this time, do you reckon? When you go um, I don't know, John. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Neve, I'm thinking of you as well, because, you know, you're talking about calm with horses, but I think you got that job when you were in the UK and it's by an English director and that is just a, an odd turn of events only in the entertainment business. Could you go to England and make a film back in Ireland? You know, sort of, could you talk a bit about that, really, in a way? Your career has been a lot in England. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so funny. There's a podcast, Charlotte Regan, and it's always like this. The start of his podcast is almost like this audio trailer. I don't know who it was who says it, but it's like I had to go away to England in order to make a living and then come back to Ireland to prove I'd made the living. It's, it's sick or something like that. But it's yeah, I left I left Ireland. I moved to London five years ago now. And and then the first job, well, second second job I did brought me back to Ireland. So <laughs> this is like an left but um yeah I've, I've been living here since but not really like it's it's like I've, Stephen Graham told me that the hardest thing you have to learn to do is to figure out where you are between jobs and that's not like physically where you are it's more just mentally and having like almost like an anchor or some kind of like pin where you just call home I just found that to be that's so important I feel as an actor because you do you're just constantly moving nothing as the people say like having a schedule is really important routine, but that completely goes out the window whenever you start filming or when you're you know prepping work and to just have um to have a place that you you're constantly coming back to I find it's just that that's kind of like one of the most important things I'm, baff, I'm kind of waffling here now but it is it's a it's a it's a stre- it's it's a profession unlike anything else and it's really hard to articulate to your friends or your family who aren't in this business because um, those are the people that you feel like you let down on, on a regular basis because you're, you miss events, you miss weddings and you miss um, christenings and it's, it's, a, it's an industry that time is like one of the most valuable entities of it and trying to you know, make things happen within a certain time frame, but nothing else around that can kind of work. So it's almost like, as what Stephen said, it's like figuring out who you are between the jobs because it's easy to know who you are when you are working, but when you're not, that's the thing you need to work on. I hope that kind of made sense. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting because it also speaks that, you know, you talk about, I, 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 you know, you went to England, whatever, but there's an awful lot. And I think, you know, Daryl, I want to talk to you about this. It's like, it's, it's, it's all about to say you went to England, but you have to find a 
agent in England. <laughs> you have to, you know what I mean? And, and it's, it's, it's hard. It's a hard business. So where do you get that confidence from? Say, Daryl, maybe you could speak a bit about that because you left to go to England, as you said earlier. And, and it's presumably, you know, been, been, been a hard, 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 um, you know, track over here. I mean, well, I mean, not, not easy, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I left about four and a half years ago to London. I kind of gave Dublin about three years after drama school and um, like I was working bits and bobs, but I was mainly doing a lot of part time work and stuff. So I just had to make the jump and I had to kind of say, right, let's give it a shot. And there wasn't really enough um, like work that was bringing me over to London. So I, I really had to kind of start again. Um, but yeah, like I don't know. I, I for me personally, I felt like you know, there was just more of a pool of actors and, and especially with diversity and stuff that I felt I had to try and put myself into the mix of because um, I just felt like I was coming up, coming up at a bit of a dead end in Dublin for a while. But yeah, it just starting again, just like, yeah, starting again, that was the toughest thing, like going back into waiting tables and like, you know, giving, I gave one about a year and I think I was really close to actually turning around and going back to Dublin and um I don't know whatever got me through, but I just managed to stick it out and, and things started to change then. But um, yeah, I I don't know how, I don't know. You just have to lean on your own kind of, you know, your own want to make it work and, and find the ways that you can, whether that's, you know, where where you're born and where you where you mainly reside or where you have to leave. And um, for me, I just had to, I had to, you know, leave. And, but I think, yeah, I've been like Neve, like I've managed to go back for projects as well, mainly for theatre, though. But um, it is a thing where you kind of I got a little bit more experience in London that is now kind of helped me come back to Dublin and do more work back home. So um, but yeah, it's it's kind of you're in the dark, I guess, when you're making these choices, because I think another thing that people are, discover when you come to London is that you also let go of a, a community in Dublin, you know, and um that was one of the most challenging things for me was trying to find a, a community in London. And I think that's also what will sustain you when you're not working and, you know, you're waiting for auditions to come in. Um, and that took years to build, you know. Um, but I think once I found that, I was like, OK, I have some sort of an anchor here now. And um, and then I was excited to be be in London. You said that you were you were after a year in London that you you were close to kind of co- co- giving up, giving it up and coming back to Dublin. Coming back yeah. to Dublin, was that if you had done that, would you have kept acting? Were you thinking of kind of making a big change, or what was the? Yeah, it was like the first ever time I I thought of quitting acting, um, and I've I've always been super stubborn. Like I always said, like I grew up in Nina, like a small town in Tipperary. So um, there was this sense where like Daryl's the actor, Daryl's going off to Hollywood, and this kind of like somewhat of a naivety to it. But um, I think growing up with that, that really got into my psyche and uh, I think after a year in London when I kind of there was a point where I looked around and I I didn't really have any friends here and uh, I was like you know waiting tables and kind of just kind of tired you know and and that was the closest you know so I think if I did go back to Dublin I would have gone back with a real like like a lot of um, uh, the wind taken out my sail Um, so I'm not sure if I would have continued in the vein that I I I started off with, um, but yeah. What What was the job, Daryl? That 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 you got that made you think I can do this in London? What was? Um, it was. Um, it wasn't even a job. God, sorry to get deep here now, but my granddad, my granddad, had passed a few years before. Um, what before I moved to London, and um, he used to say this. He used to say this. Uh, or, at his funeral, there was a flower, there was a hanging flower basket and a lot of people, um, there was a flower basket outside his front door. And uh, on the way out of his house, a lot of people used to bump their head into it uh, just by accident because it was right outside the front door. And um, yeah, I remember just him kind of close to when he was about to pass away that he was going to continue, you know, um, providing support or whatever. And uh, I was sweeping a, a laneway in London in an Irish cafe actually my first job here and it was that it was like there was a particular moment where I was like I think I need to just go home and there was like hanging flower baskets in that lane where I was sweeping and I just like bumped my head and uh 
it just threw me straight back to what he was saying. So it wasn't particularly um, a job as such, but it was just kind of more the support, I guess, that my family had given me throughout the whole process. And that like, that's, that's just what kind of kept me moving forward. And then actually jobs came, but um, I did, yeah, it wasn't like a physical evidence. And I think that's a major thing as well. If people make the move is like not relying on that physical evidence, just trying to find um, sources that support you. Uh, without the kind of industry saying that like you can go do this you know how about how did it work for you Claire because I mean you must have had to find something to sustain you through that whole process of deciding that you could write herself and then bringing it all the way to where it's gone um, yeah well when I started to write herself it was because I was giving up acting and uh, so similar to Daryl where I was like having that back against the wall moment and um, I'd been in New York and just doing pilot season and I just came up a lot up against a lot of challenges there about what I look like and what you know about like loads of stuff and it was just very difficult because basically I was at a point where I was like Jesus I've been working for five years and I haven't really had any screen work you know and I need to be real with myself so I kind of asked myself what else I could do in order to be on a film set and for me the next thing that I knew how to do was only just like instinctively write. I'd written a little bit for a, a fringe show. But then when just a certain moment in time happened when my friend was going through something and then I was inspired to write a story about a woman that builds a house for herself, it was weird. It was like that thing, as we all have talked about, the, the typical Irish immigrant thing, like, you know, you have to go away to come back again, but you have to come back with something. <laughs> and, but, but, like, for me, it was like I was, I was out in in New York and I was I kind of I actually just decided I was going to do it and I didn't know how and it was a bit like Daryl says and you don't know how you're going to do it but you just kind of go right I'm just going to commit to this thing and so I got earlier flights home and left that all behind me and um and began but it was tough I think what I've realized is that as Neve was saying as well about trying to find something that's constant in the background of your hugely nomadic and erratic sort of roller coaster career um, is, is so important. And sometimes that's not physical. It's actually like you end up having some people that you find along the way that you can always go back to. Um, so I've realized, I always call them keepers, like every job you might get a keeper. Right. And, um, and those keepers end up being like really, really something special through your life. So people that I made friends with earlier in my career, even now I could get in touch with them and they would still be there for me. And at the toughest moments, they were, they'd be there. Like I, I remember meeting people, yeah, in the National Theatre, like Justine Mitchell, and we, we still have a friendship. Or Kieran Hines, I remember he, he wrote a, note to me when I was opening at a show in London out of nowhere like I hadn't seen him in two years and he sent me this card on the first preview and it was really like long long written card you know and I've realized that actually like quite opposite to most people's perception of acting and and our world is that we can actually be very very each other and know that we're all up, up for the same jobs and um, when you get it when one gets it and the other doesn't you're like grand you know sure look that's the way it goes and we just know there's a you know um an up and down to it but trying to I think just trying to forge some sort of background net of some consistency with with some of the people along the way helps because we all understand the loneliness and the um the challenges and then the also then the moments where it's just full on it's nothing but people and activity we know the bipolar nature of it you know yeah, you, you got a you got a um an agent in the uk i think quite quite early on i i'm just wondering you know i suppose here I'm, i'd probably be looking you're, you're giving amazing advice and <laughs> i think any actress would, would be really lucky to 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 listen to to this um and uh, you know especially as it's so current you know what you're experiencing because your films are actually coming out right now you're working in it right now it's not a historical sort of thing Fionn, what what kind of what made you go to the uk like what what you know what guidance did you get that you thought really helped you that you you would want to pass on i think i, I it was it's, it's odd because i my going to the uk was kind of that i was spending more time there 
um, than I was in Ireland. And I was constantly going back and forth for, for meetings that I, I was kind of, I got kind of tired of flying at 6am in the morning and then getting like the last flight home. And I felt like that was really affecting the meetings I was doing too, because I, I was getting in and I would be so tired, but I, I'd also have like seven hours before the meeting. So I'd just be sitting in like a Starbucks uh, rehearsing lines, but like getting asked to uh, leave um, <laughs> repeatedly. But um, yeah, it was kind of more that I had spent more time there and I was like, I, so I should, I should move. But it took a while for me to actually do that. And then, I mean, two of um, the, the biggest uh, things for me moving, I'm um, were one uh, doing Handsome Devil um, with with John, but also um, being a part of the Screen International Stars of Tomorrow as well with with you, Finn. So it was it was um, those were two things that really were like, okay, I should go and I I should just go and 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 do that. But it, it was that thing of like, no sooner had I gotten there, um, I was shooting in Ireland for like <laughs> eight, eight months. So I like I got there and then um, was like. I like just bought like a mattress and uh, and like bed sheets and it was like I'd gotten my flat that was like had nothing in it and just had a mattress on the floor and was like oh what a beautiful home and then went uh, back, <laughs> uh, back to, uh, to Ireland to to shoot but yeah that was kind of how I ended up going over. <laughs> Dono, Dono, you you sort of came back with an Irish language film with Arat, um, which has done incredibly well. I mean, I can't imagine that you probably thought when you went over there that there was going to be a market for 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 that, and you know that not I don't mean commercial, but an appetite, you know, to 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 make these kind of films. And you spoke earlier about things you you thought were were happening in Ireland. Can could you talk a little bit more about you know about the turnaround in the, to, in that respect. Yeah, yeah, and I guess just to clarify, like it's funny. Um, I I, I had kind of left acting to be honest. I'd moved upstate to Buffalo, New York, because it was so much cheaper than New York City, and I had some friends there. And and Tom Sullivan reached out with uh, a script, and and he 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 kind of sent me the script and asked to if I was interested. And and I said yes, thinking that you know he probably wouldn't get the funding, and lo, you know lo and behold he did. Um, and the last thing that any of us thought um, would be that an Irish language film would would I guess have the resonance that that Arak has had. Um, and I don't know if that's commercial, but it seems to have captured. Um, an audience uh, who's interested or who who were interested in kind of looking at a a, a pretty I, I hope authentic film that portrays the Irish famine and um, you know I, I certainly didn't think Finn that uh, you know an Irish language film shot in Letter Mullen in twenty days for one point two million um, would you know garner the the momentum it did and. Um, Certainly on my journey, you know, to echo, I don't know if it was Daryl or, or Finn there, but the screen stars of tomorrow, you know, and, and uh, that recognition has been has been really pivotal. Um, so it's funny, you like, I don't think you, you never know what's going to, I guess, be the vehicle to get you to the next thing. And no matter how small or big it is, I think if you, um, you know, hopefully treat it all the same and, and do your best, uh, you don't know which one or which which project will will take you to the next one, um, yeah. But you said you had a good feeling about about the way the way things are at the moment, and I'm going to ask yeah, John, John about that next. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, just I guess to speak very briefly about um, kind of I suppose the Irish language circle because I suppose that's where my my background lies. You know, to date. Um, um, it's great to see on Colleen Kuhn just picked up a prize in Berlin and, you know, it's very cool to see uh, the Irish language being, I guess, seen as an international language. And, uh, you know, um, when there are films made in, in other languages, why wouldn't we make them in, in Irish, you know? So it's, it's, it's a very exciting time, I think, to be working in Ireland. John, I was going to ask you about that in your in your experiences, you know, seeing how things are changing, although you, you did make Papi Tulo in, in, in the States and working on the outlaws in the UK. What, what's your sense of the Irish um, film, film industry at the moment? And and I, and I guess this is something I'm going to ask everyone, like, what do you want from it that it's not giving you right now? You know, <laughs> how, how can it be better? Um, well, it's an, <clears throat> excuse me, it's in an amazing place, uh, clearly, 
there's so much talent. Um, I would love for uh, us to make sure that we protect the voices of Irish storytellers and not um, rely too heavily on inward investment in the uh, film industry, which is important too, but the crews and, and um, kind of produ production infrastructures in Ireland are well taken care of by inward investment, but very often some of the creative talent can find it difficult to sustain themselves within that. You know, it's hard um, sometimes for actors to be seen for some of the bigger jobs that are coming into Ireland for streamers and studios from outside. And similarly, I think for writers as well, it's, it's important that we continue to protect that and give them an opportunity, fund them to make uh, films and to tell their stories in the way that they have done historically, but keep it going at a greater level. Because if there is more money coming into our business, we have to make sure that we spend it on the, the right creative voices to keep it going, you know, because I think everybody who's here in this chat maybe has benefited at some point from being given a shot on the basis of their, you know, being from Ireland. And, and, and that's important that we keep that going. I, I'd, love, I'd love for that not to be lost, you know. I mean, what's the, what's the, do you, do you think, do you, do you believe in a quota system? Do you believe in, in a, in a, you know, that, that, that every production that comes in should be hiring this many people and, you know, that diversity should be written into any government funding that happened, you know, or do you believe that that works and what's your thoughts on that? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to know whether it should be like formally, maybe it should, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think diversity quotas are helpful in keeping people honest in that regard. Yeah. And, but, uh, I just feel as a general thing, we have to, like Donald mentioned, Colleen Kuhn, and you just look at that and you kind of go, well, that's actually one of the biggest stories, you know, who cares about 100 million coming in through this other job? You know, actually, that's a huge example of like, I don't know, something that can make you feel really proud as an Irish creative person. So right. I just hope that we're able to find space for those stories to continue happening in the context of this bigger story about our industry doing well, you know, which is undoubtedly is. What, Daryl, what do you feel? What's your, I mean, you're, you, you know, you didn't, you haven't really properly worked in the Irish film industry. I, you know, I don't know. I wanted to ask you whether that's something that you would like to do and what you think needs to change. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I struggled a little bit in Dublin trying to get involved, but it, I think back then I was a little more naive. You know, I think, I think it's easier just to go, well, everyone's out, you know, there's no space for me, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think is a bigger issue in terms of like there being enough, you know, writers of diversity and, um, and making sure we're commissioning voices that, you know, that we haven't seen in Ireland and stuff. And so it's not as simple as because like even the pool of actors that, uh, that are diverse, say, in Ireland, black and brown people, it's there's not a whole lot, you know, and, and I think it stems back obviously with writers and and producers. And, you know, so it's I think it'll take time. Um, but I think the main thing is that we just keep considering the voices that we haven't heard. Um, but that also comes from like encouraging writers of color to write their story, you know, um, because otherwise, you know, it's not going to be written for you. Um, so I, and I also don't believe in quotas in a way, because I think it'll take away from finding authentic stories. I don't think it's about just taking boxes. Um, mm. I think it's just about being open to, finding stories that we haven't heard um um yeah so i'd love to see you know an increase in that way but i know it'll take time and i know it's not as simple as just you know it's, it's not straightforward basically yeah i just i mean so you know in the uk it's not it's a quotas it's yeah you have to have a certain percentage the, the only thing about the quotas in that respect is, is if, if you fail on the quotas then you can be held to account mm. <laughs> you know, but, which is why I mentioned that word which which no one really likes but if you, if you you know you can actually you know and the same thing like if a film festival has doesn't have enough female directors or doesn't have enough you know you can actually sort of say that the numbers are wrong but I mean but but moving on Claire can can you tell tell you know tell us maybe what what would have made your role to herself you know, your road, road to herself easier or better? Like what, what could be better? Um, I'm trying to think. Because it actually went really well in the end, but like on the way no, there. But, well, the first, I remember the first year applying for um, a screenplay development fund and not getting it, getting it, but I'd written a whole screenplay, submitted it and did all the applications as it says online. 
And then it was only when I when I got into a short film for the first time, somebody told me some inside news, inside scoop that, oh, no, you have to go in and have a cup of coffee with somebody in there in order to get your application to actually be considered. And I was just gutted because I was like, what? I didn't know there's an unwritten rule. So like if there's unwritten rules, bloody write them like is what I'd say, because there's, just, <laughs> there's lots of new people that don't know the clicky little rules. <laughs> and I had a year of like, oh, well, they don't want me. So I did that and then found out like, oh, I just need to have a cup of coffee with like it was Rory in the end, Roy Martin. And then when I submitted and they knew who I was coming for it because they'd met me, they knew I wasn't just a rant, you know, like and I understand that. But like if that is a a stipulation then put it on the website just like because if you want the new people in and you want to meet them face to face well that's how you're going to do it you're not going to do it by them finding in some sort of <laughs> backwards way um so i'd say that would help um otherwise it's just uh i just agree with everything that um daryl was saying and like when we were casting herself jesus we had such a struggle casting some of the roles that were more diverse and um, it was really tough actually uh, finding exactly what we needed and I'd actually done it all based on the diaspora and the numbers in Ireland like when I was writing it so it was really interesting to find out the as what what Daryl was saying I found that out in practice but actually we still managed to source great people that then they're informed by that experience and I think people realize that there's a demand then for them as well and they might get more involved as well which is good yeah Neve, what what would your suggestion be what would you improve in the Irish film industry? No, I mean, you know, what, what, what did you not know? I and mean, what Claire's just said is, is, you know, pretty, pretty par for the course, isn't it really, with the film business? There's a way around it, but someone has to let you know how. Yeah. It's, it's, I suppose every, every one of us here have had different experience of how we got into the industry or, or our own experience of um, each job. And no, no two of us have worked on the same, same thing. So it's, I don't know, it was, it was, I was talking to friends and mine recently we say it wouldn't be great if actors got paid a tenner for every time they did an audition or had to send in a self tape um, mm-hmm. <laughs> because of the amount of work and time that is spent um for you to, to put yourself on tape um because it's a considered it's a considered time that you're given um how long is it like how long is it on average need i'm always fascinated by that because obviously i'm on the other side of that I think there's, there's been rules now that have changed that you get more time you should be given at least i think it's like Five, five days, I think minimum, but now, you know, it can change. It can be like the tape has to be in by tomorrow. So um, you kind of have to, it's the idea of like bringing up your friends and going like, I need you to help me with this on Zoom. Can you do that? And you're, you're, there's only so many times you can ask someone before you're like, <laughs> like you start running out of, start running out of um, favors. So it's, it's, yeah. And like, because Zoom and, tapes have become so accessible for casting directors it's amazing because a people are getting seen that probably wouldn't get seen um but yeah you do you, you don't want to be doing a half hour first audition just because um you can so it's you know it's like if you don't care about the character why should the person who's watching the tape but then i don't know i think maybe things like turnaround times for for crew especially need to i think feel feel they need to be changed i think it's um because we do this job in short term kind of pockets, it's it's doable, but it's not sustainable on the long term. Um, and p- crews that are going from job to job to job and doing 16 hour days, um, that's not sustainable. So I think if, if I were to change anything, would it, people could can just still do this job and also still have a family and a life and, and things can be done safely because it's, I find that mistakes are, are made whenever people are tired and that's one basic thing that we just need to function but that's going very deep but other than that <laughs> it's great <laughs> it's all grand <laughs> what about you Fionn what's your what's your feeling um I mean I I agree with everyone which I guess isn't very interesting uh, points to make but I I really do I think I think one thing that um going back to what Daryl had said about um you know encouraging a more diverse range of um of uh, of stories and or, or voices i think when i was like when i was growing up like i i started acting very young but there was never a moment where i didn't 
like seeing films that were regardless if they were Irish films or international films I never um I never felt like it was out of reach I always felt represented on screen because I was um a young white guy you know and, and so I would see films all the time that I would it, it never would it never seemed alien to me that I maybe could do that someday obviously there's lots of barriers to that but um I guess one thing that I hope has improved um there are of course now stories being told by um in or there's a more well, there is a more diverse range of voices which I hope is encouraging people um you know who are younger to write um write their own stories too um and feel like that is something that they'd be able to do um you know I I certainly growing up I uh, maybe one thing that I never experienced was I can't remember growing up really watching an Irish um, queer film. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm maybe, maybe, maybe they're where, but that's something that I think, you know, that's one thing that John has made such a huge um, difference on. And, and we got to share that experience with people all over the world, but particularly in Ireland, it was really beautiful seeing kids who maybe had never seen that experience on screen before being able to say, I really, I, I really uh, was able to relate to that. So I think it is getting better and better, but I think, um, I, I guess the responsibility is to not, um, is to celebrate the success, but also not to ignore um, the progress that still needs to be made. Everyone else's answer is way better than mine. So <laughs> but, but, no, 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 you make, you make a good point there. And, and, and actually you're going to bring me into my next question, which is probably my last question. It's kind of going to be the same to everyone because I, be, you know, I, I understand that you would have all gone into acting, directing, you know, the writing because of something you saw. And I'm just wondering if that was an Irish film or, you know, what film that might have been, what, what particular, you know, actor or, or type of film. And the second part of that question is, is, is that being made in Ireland? Or, or if it isn't, would you, what would you like, what's the Irish film industry not making at the moment that you would like to see? And I'm going to start by putting Niamh Algar on the spot with that. <laughs> <laughs> what would I love the Irish film industry? Oh, God. Oh God, so quick, don't start. <laughs> so, come on, think, Neve. No, go on, Donald. Can you think of, can you think of, yeah. can you think back then? It, it's, I remember seeing um, Killian Murphy on stage, actually, when I was doing like in fourth year or something. And uh, and then I think the wind that shook the barley or the wind that shakes the barley came out um, pretty soon after. And uh, that was definitely a big, big, his, his performance in that film, um, I remember, left a, a kind of a, definitely an imprint. Um, in terms of things that I'd like to see, I, I think just that every person, regardless of their experience or background, um, would have the chance, would have the same chance of getting their story told, you know. Um, I, I, and, and if that comes in the way of funding and support and... Um, you know, I, I always think that there could be more money thrown at, at the arts, you know, maybe that's because, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm working in the arts, but I, I feel like we, yeah, that sometimes there's support which feels like lip service. I'm talking specifically at a governmental level, and it would be great to see that actually realized into into you know um more money more money but no um yeah just that that we'd you know be supported i suppose to to tell our stories neve are you ready with your answer or you can just i think i just love to see just more like developmental funding just like in the sense that giving giving out actors the room to play for like workshops and exploring things that aren't going to essentially it's not like what I love so much when I when I worked with Shea Meadows was we, we were exploring the characters we were exploring exploring the story I mean no matter what we did even if it was off the wall it wasn't wrong it was just trying giving giving the space to try something out and I think that um sometimes you just don't get that opportunity to play anymore and and it always has to become packaged and and perfect and ready to go and I think well 
I was in Northern Ireland, we can have that opportunity is to just find the ideas in in new spaces and in with groups of people as opposed to waiting for the work to come to you as an actor that because like we have no control we we've a certain amount of control but at the end of the day we're the ones that are being brought on kind of last and be so nice to have I don't know a space where you're part of that from the beginning and um yeah I don't know as a director John do you think that's 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 possible and also the same question to you like who was it and what's missing Oh, it's totally possible. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting perspective um, and a really interesting approach at, you know, what people call writing, which which I think is maybe just like creation. You know, like I think we can get hung up on the idea of the draft and the, you know, the the, the words on the page, but I think right like workshopping and working on scenes with actors is a, is a form of writing that's equally valuable. You know, I think it's a really interesting way to generate material that comes from outside your own lived experience, you know? Um, and I think with that in mind, the one thing I'd love to see is more writer's rooms in Ireland, because I think that's the best way to, you know, to Daryl's point, my feeling is that that's the best way to create diversity of expression, because if you're less experienced, if you're a young writer from a diverse background who has less experience because of the systematic barriers to that, being a voice in a writer's room where maybe you've put on a play, but you haven't had a chance to get a TV credit. If you can get a seat in a writer's room with four or five or six other writers and contribute to that story, it's just naturally going to, that story is just going to check out better because it has more perspectives, more diverse perspectives in it. So it's more of the world that we live in. So I think there's a real interest in Ireland and some of it is because of our cultural history in authors, single authored stories and, we place a huge amount of value on that. But I think the um, the culture of the writer's room and of multiple voices inputting into a single project that then has a broader perspective is a really interesting thing we should be going after much more for all sorts of reasons. So. That's a good point, actually, going to, to what Dar- Daryl said. Daryl, who, who is your kind of person that you looked to when you were younger? And, and again, you know, what do you feel is missing? I have a feeling it might be the same as <laughs> what John has just said. Yeah, um, who was it? I think... Uh, I went to see a play in Galway and Marty Ray was playing Hamlet. I, I was in transition year and um, I remember just seeing this is kind of the first proper play I saw outside of Nina. And uh, that definitely kind of, I think the ho- whole class were like just there to mess, but I was just blown away. Um, so that kind of started off my process. But um, yeah, just to reiterate what everyone's saying. And John, that's a great point about getting you know I think it's about starting the process early and just getting voices into into writers rooms I think it's just about encouragement and um and being open you know um to exploring those voices and I think naturally it's going to get better and better um you know to a full kind of fully represented Ireland and I think that's will serve us all you know it'll serve kind of a world that we see and will inspire us in ways that I think will surprise us and so I think it's on the way. I think it's just we need to keep keep pushing it. Well, that seems like a very um, brilliant and hopeful point on which to actually end this conversation, um, if it's all right with everyone. It's been really enjoyable listening to to everything that you've had to say. And, yeah, the future is bright. And, and well done to everyone for all you've done. And happy 20th anniversary to Diff. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>